Today we're going to be taking a sidestep from functions and we're going to look at what are called sequences and series. In essence, it's a lot of pattern recognition, be able to recognize a list of numbers. So let's first look at a scenario. There's a classic story in many cultures where a hero saves the day and he rescues the kingdom and the king allows him to choose his or her reward. And so we have two heroes here that choose two different rewards. And we want to see how those different rewards pay off for these heroes. So the first one is Hector, who says, put $1 on the first square of this checkerboard. So on square number one. And then add $2 to the previous number of dollars. So you're just adding $2 each time. So you start with $1 in the first square. And then in the next square, you take the previous amount, which is the $1, and you add 2. And so you end up with, well, $3. And then on the next square, on the square number 3, you take the previous money, previous amount of dollars, and add $2 to that. I'm going to write the previous amount of money as 1 plus 2. Even though it is $3, but this will help us recognize the pattern. So this is 1 plus 2, and then we add $2 to that and we get $5. And then the next one, we take the previous amount of money, which is one plus two plus two, which is really five, and we add two to that, and so we get $7. And then the next one, we take the previous amount of money, and we're gonna write it as one plus two plus two plus two, and we add $2 to that, and so we end up with $9 here. And then we're going to jump onto square number 10, square number 20, square number 64. So we want to figure out how much money in total he's going to have and how much money he gets at the end. And so to figure that out, rather than counting and listing out every single dollar value, we can create a formula to figure out how much money he's going to have on square number, say, n. n is just the variable representing the square number. So we can recognize a pattern here. So what we have is starting with square number three, if you take a look at what we're doing here, we're doing one plus two plus two. Two plus two, we can rewrite into a little bit simpler of a way that's two times two because you're adding two to itself twice. So adding a number to itself many times is multiplication. So this is one plus two times two. And then the next one in square number four, we're doing one plus two plus two plus two, so we're adding two to itself three times. So this is one plus two times three. And then on square number five, we're doing one plus two to itself four times. So this is one plus two times four. And now when we're looking at trying to create a generalization or general equation here, we always look at between these different expressions, what parts stay the same and what parts are changing. So the parts that are staying the same, well, we have the one, that's like that starting amount on square number one. So we're always going to have one here and we're adding to the one two times some number. So the one and the two here are always staying the same. And then we're seeing what number are we multiplying that two by? And we want to relate that to the square number because we're trying to make a formula or an equation for the amount of money on square number n. So n is the square number. So looking at square number three, that multiplying value is two. On square number four, that multiplying value is three. On square number five, that multiplying value is four. So that multiplying value is always one less than the square number. Or in other words, to write that in math notation, we say that that multiplying value is n minus one. And so this will allow us to find the dollar amount on any square number. So if we want to find the dollar amount on square number, say 10, we just plug in 10 for n. So we do one plus two times 10 minus one. And so this comes out to $19 because two times 10 minus one, which is nine, two times nine is 18 plus one is 19. And the next one, if you want to figure out the amount of money on square number 20, we do 1 plus 2 times 20 minus 1. And this is equal to $39. And then the last one is 
on the very last square, square 64, that's the end of the checkerboard, this is 1 plus 2 times 64 minus 1, and we end up with $127. So this type of growth we've seen before, and we did an example similar to this when we were working with exponentials with Hector and Yolanda talking about their salaries. But this is not an exponential. This is what you would call a linear sequence or a linear pattern because we're adding the same number each time. So Hector's reward amounts follow a linear. And we will also use the term, and more frequently throughout this unit, we will use the term arithmetic. So arithmetic is more description of a sequence. And we'll talk about what a sequence really means versus what a function is. But when we're working with a sequence, a list of numbers, essentially, we use the term arithmetic. We can also use linear, but we have both of those. And so a linear or arithmetic sequence is a sequence or pattern where the values are changing by a constant additive amount. And so we have different ways of representing this linear arithmetic sequence. One way is with what's called the recursive notation. The recursive notation essentially is just a way of saying, what are you adding each time? So looking at our numbers here, our sequence, if you look at the values, we're adding by two each time. So the way we write the recursive notation, the word recursive means you kind of build up on the previous term. So when you say a sub n is equal to a sub n minus one, plus two, what this is saying, we'll talk more about the notation here as we move on, but a sub n, n is the position number, right, of square number n, that's the square number, so a sub n is saying that money amount on square number n. And then when we say n minus one here, this is a subscript, right, it's not multiplying or subtracting to the actual term value, it's a subscript just indicating position. So a sub n here is money on square n. And then n minus 1 is just saying go back one position. So it's, if you want to figure out the amount of money on any square, you take the previous amount of money and you add 2 to it. That's all this is saying. And then the general notation, that's what we wrote above, this will allow us to get the term value in any square number. So this is 1 plus 2 times n minus 1. And then if we want to figure out what is Hector's total reward, because that is a natural question to ask, how much money did he get in total? We're trying to find the sum of the amounts on each of the squares, or the sum of the sequence, which we call a series. And so the way we write this, and we'll dissect this notation as we move forward, but the way we write this is in this notation, and if you have a graphing calculator, you can find the sum here in the graphing calculator using this, or we can do it in Desmos as well. However, the Desmos scientific calculator doesn't work with this sum notation, doesn't have that capability, so we can use the graphing calculator in Desmos to find this. So in the Desmos graphing calculator, we go over to the right-hand side here where it says functions, and we click on functions, and we scroll down and we find this big capital sigma. That's what this is, a capital sigma. And it fills in some stuff for us. So the way it was written, and we just write it how we saw it on the page. We write it as n equals one, and then the top here, you put 64, that's the number of terms. And then in here, it's always nice to write in parentheses, one plus two times in parentheses, n minus 1, so go to the ABC button, n minus 1. And then close the parentheses, and we have the sum of this sequence, which we call a series. A sum is a series. And if you're on a keyboard or on a computer or something, you can also type in the word sum, just S-U-M, and it'll pop up with that function as well, rather than having to click on the function button and scroll and find. Either way it works, type sum, or you can find the sum button here under the function tab. 
And so we get the sum of his rewards is 4,096. So now let's take a look at Yolanda's rewards and we will compare and contrast the two. So with Yolanda, she says to put $1 on the first square of the checkerboard, then double the number of dollars on each square. So we're starting with $1 and then you take the previous term on the second square. So you take the previous term, which was $1 and you multiply that by two. So you take one and you just multiply it by two because you're doubling the number. So that's multiplying by two, and this is $2. Nice and straightforward. And then the next one is take the previous term, which is $2, or I'm gonna write it as one times two. So that's the previous term, and you multiply that by $2. And then from there we get $4. And then on the next one, you take the previous term, which is $4, or you're going to write it as 1 times 2 times 2, and then you multiply that by 2, and that gives you $8. And we'll do this one more time. You take the previous term, which is 1 times 2 times 2 times 2, and you multiply that by 2, and you get $16. And so now we can find a pattern, just like we did on the hectares, we can find a pattern here. Let's start with three because that's where we start seeing a pattern. If we have one times two times two, well, we can rewrite two times two as two squared. If you're doing a number times itself, that's exponents. That's what we did with the exponentials. So this is equal to, we can write it as one times two squared. And then same thing with square number four. We can write one times two times two times two. We're multiplying two by itself three times. So that's two cubed. And then on square number five, we have one times two, we're multiplying two by itself four times. And so we can write a general formula here, which would be, if we look at what's staying the same, the one and the two are staying the same, even though the one out front doesn't really matter, but it will matter in the future when we're looking at different sequences. We have one times two, and the thing that's changing is the exponent. And comparing the exponent to the square number, the exponent is always one less than the square number. So the exponent on square number three is two, the exponent on square number four is three, exponent on square number five is four. So the exponent here is always one less than the square number, so this is n minus one. And so to get the money amounts on each of these different square numbers, we can just plug in the square number in for n and just simplify. So for square number 10, we're doing one times two to the n minus one, where n is 10, and so this is equal to, putting this in the calculator, we're really just doing 1 times 2 to the 9, and this is $512. And the next one is 1 times 2 to the n minus 1, where n is 20, so this is 20 minus 1, which is really 2 to the 19, and 2 to the 19 is a very large number, it's 500. 24,288. So that's how much money is on square 20. And now we're just going to keep doubling this money or this number each square. So once we get to square 64, the amount of money we have is one times two to the 64 minus one, is, which is equal to, when we put this in the calculator, we get in scientific notation, and I'm going to leave it in scientific notation because it's quite a large number. In scientific notation, we get 9.233 times 10 to the 18th power. Now, what this means is we would take the decimal, and since the exponent on the 10 is positive, we would move the decimal over to the right 18 times. This is a very large number. And the story goes that when the king realizes how much money he has to pay, he goes and beheads the hero because they tricked him. But we can actually work out and figure out how much money Yolanda would actually be getting paid. So this type of growth or this type of sequence is exponential, right? We have a base and it's raised to a power. That's the exponential sequence or exponential growth. But when we're working with sequences, you will also hear it called geometric. And moving forward, this is what we will be calling this type of growth. And so the exponential or geometric sequences change not by the same additive amount, it's by a constant multiplicative value.
So in the recursive notation, this is just telling you how to go from one term to the next. So to get any term number n, you take the previous term n minus one, so go back one term, and you multiply it by two. Because that's what we're doing here, we're just multiplying each term by two. So that general notation that we wrote is one times two to the n minus one. And if we want to figure out how much mo money Yolanda is getting at the end of the day, we're adding up every single dollar amount on each of the checkerboards. We're finding the sum here, which is called a series when you're finding the sum of a sequence. And we can put it into Desmos as well. So in Desmos, remember, we can click the function button, scroll down and find the sigma, or you can just type in SUM. So in the bottom here, we just are essentially copying and pasting. We'll talk about what the different forms or pieces of the summation notation represent, but you can maybe deduce some of that information. So in the top here, we put 64, and then down here is two to the, so we're doing exponent, we wanna put in parentheses, n minus one, which is a, again, a very, very large number, which makes sense because that last value on square 64 was a very large number. So this is 1.845 times 10 to the power of 19. So Yolanda's getting a lot of money. And a very important distinction here and something with our terminology is that we have what's called a sequence, which a sequence is an ordered list of numbers. So here we have these sequences listed out. The sequence of Hector's reward amount is one, three, five, seven. So that list of the dollar amounts of Hector's rewards is a sequence. And for Yolanda, same thing, one, two, four, eight, and so on. This is a list in order of values. That's what we call a sequence. And so the sequence is the list of values and it has sort of like a position or index because it is in order, so we have to give each value an order. So the first term, $1, is term number one, or we say the n value or the position number is one. The next term is position two. The next term is position three. So the position is essentially that n value in the sequence. And then we have from a sequence, if we were to add up the terms of the sequence, we get a series. So what we have written down here are the series, the sums of the sequence. So we're gonna be using these terms moving forward. So these are good to get familiar and acquainted with these definitions of these terms here. And you might be wondering, well, we've already talked about linear functions, we already talked about exponential functions, but these are not functions, these are sequences. So there is a difference between function and sequence. So the difference between function and sequence is that with functions, you first of all have different notation. We use f of x, where the input is x, and you write the output as f of x, so f parentheses x. So x is indicating the input, and then in the function we use x. And it's still something with an input output. x is input, f of x is output. With a sequence, we use n as the input, and we have a different notation. We use a subscript to indicate what that input is. So instead of saying f of x, we say a sub n. Sub, s-u-b, as in boy, is short for subscript. So a sub n, that's the output value, where n is the input value. And the most important difference between functions, functions and sequences is that with functions, for the most part, you can plug in any number. Functions have, in general, a continuous domain. Continuous domain meaning we can plug in the numbers one, two, three, but we can also plug in the numbers negative one, negative two. We can plug in one half. We can plug in the square root of pi. Anything that we want, really, for at least for exponentials, that domain is negative infinity, positive infinity. So we can plug in any number that we want. With sequences, we only plug in these numbers here. We only plug in the natural counting numbers. So just the numbers one, two, three, four. We can't plug in one half. We can't plug in negative numbers. 
we just start with one as our first input value and then two is the next input value. So the, the n values are the positions or the index of the different term values in the sequence. So that's the main difference between functions and sequences. The notation and also what we're allowed to plug in. So the domain you can think of sequences is just counting numbers. So let's work a little bit more with the notation of sequences and see how we evaluate the different terms of a sequence. So again, the n is the position or it tells us the term number that we're looking at. And when we are writing what the term value is, we use the a sub n. So if we write a sub 1 here, this would be the first term in the sequence. So if we have this sequence here, a sub n is equal to negative 1 to the n times 3n plus 2. To figure out what is a sub 1, well, you just plug in 1 into n. So you have negative 1 to the n, which is 1, times 3 times n, which we're saying is 1, plus 2. And so when we put this in the calculator, we get negative 5. And then on the next one, a sub 2, it's just the same thing. You just plug in 2 for n, just like you do with functions. So this is 2 in the exponent times 3 times n, which we said is 2, plus 2 is equal to, this ends up being 8. Now notice we're switching from negative to positive here because the exponent on the negative 1 is 1 on the first one, so negative 1 to the 1 is negative 1. But on the next one, negative 1 squared is positive 8. And on the next one here, we have negative 1 to the third power. And now here, this is an odd number, so we're going to have negative 1 times itself an odd number of times, so the end result is going to be negative. We can already tell that from the exponent. So this is 3 times n, which is 3 plus 2 is equal to negative 11. And then the next one is negative 1 to the power of 4, because we're finding a sub 4, so we're saying n is 4, times 3 times n, which is 4, plus 2. And so we end up getting this as positive now, because negative 1 to the 4th power is positive 1, and it's positive 14. And then this is negative 1 to the 5th power times... 3 times n, which is 5, and we're adding 2 to that, and so we get this is going to be a negative number again because the exponent on the negative 1 is odd, so that's a negative 17. So you can see like the term numbers here, the absolute values, we're adding 3 each time, but then we're sort of alternating positive negative. And so that's what the term values are. This is a sub 1, this is a sub 2, a sub 3, a sub 4, and a sub 5. And so that's how we interpret the notation of a sequence and how we find the values of a sequence. And now for a series, the notation with that, remember the series is the sum of the sequence. So we will use two different forms of the series. We can use a capital letter S, S standing for some, or we can use that capital letter sigma. That capital letter sigma is a Greek letter, and it's S, kind of sigma, sum, same thing, start with an S, to indicate the series or to indicate a sum. So if we're working with that same sequence, if we write this notation here, S sub 5, this is what we call the fifth partial sum, or we can say it's the sum of the first five terms. We call it a partial sum because technically the sequence can go on forever, but we're just looking at the first five terms. So we're creating a sum of the first five terms. So that's why it's a partial sum. And so to list that S sub five out, what we do is we just take each term and add those first five terms together. So we have negative five plus eight plus negative 11 plus 14 and then plus negative 17. And so this is, again, a sub 1 plus a sub 2 plus a sub 3 plus a sub 4 plus a sub 5. And so if you put all these numbers into your calculator, you end up getting negative 11. And so in that summation notation, and just down below, we'll break apart this summation notation, 
or the sigma notation, we write it like this and we say that sum is negative 11. So to dissect this summation or sigma notation some more, what's going on is when you see the sigma notation, that's meaning sum. And so what we start with is in the bottom here, this says i is equal to one. So this is indicating what your variable is. So it's indicating what your variable is, and it's also indicating the start position. So it's it telling you that you're starting with one as the first position. And then in the top of the sigma, this five is indicating the end position or the last n value, or in this case, the last i value, that's our variable. And then here is the equation or the general form of the sequence. And the way we read this, if we were to say this out loud or think it in our head, we would say the sum of the equation negative one to the i times three i plus two from one to five. And it's found by essentially finding the first five terms of the sequence and then adding them all together. Now something to note here is that you see i written here. Normally in your previous math classes or even in this math class, when you see i, you think i is the square root of negative one and generally that's true. But for some reason, people really like using i as an index, most likely because i stands for index. And so when we have i as the index or essentially the variable of the sequence, then we can also use i as a variable, not just that like complex or imaginary i. And so you know whether or not you're going to use i as like an imaginary number or if it's the variable by indicating here at the bottom where it's saying i is equal to one. Whatever this variable is at the bottom of the sigma notation, this is indicating what your variable is. So that's what you're plugging into so you're plugging into i. So you plug in one into i, you plug in two into i, and so on. 